Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on the world of high-performance computing. Today, my guest is from Luxterra. We have Brian Welch. He is the Director of Product Marketing at the company. So, Brian, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me, Rich. Well, well, well thanks for coming on, Brian. You know, I, I, I know about uh, uh, Luxterra from my days at uh, Sun. We used to partner with you guys with Photonics, but... Um, what I thought we'd do today is just go through your slides and then follow that with uh, Q and A. Yeah, that sounds great. And uh, you know, it's nice to to hear that you're familiar with us, and you know, definitely know some of the people at, at Sun since they're local here. So you bet. Nice their history there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about a little bit today. It was just sort of you know, silicon photonics for HPC interconnects, and you know how you know we think they're going to be important for future generations of um, supercomputers. Just a quick background on silicon photonics. It's basically the creation of optical structures and optical systems in silicon materials. Uh, you know, adding passive as well as active functions such as modulation and detection into a common platform with electronics. And the, the development of this technology started in earnest in the early 2000s when CMOS lithography became precise enough to allow uh, quality definition of optical structures. The, the goal of silicon photonics, or at least our goal, has been to leverage as much of the electronics industry infrastructure as possible, both the design and, design and fabrication methodologies, um, wafer manufacturing, packaging tests, to make optics look behave as much like an electronic system as they can. And in so doing to enable very high levels of integration uh, to do unique things that, you know, where there's really no boundary between electrical and optical functions and you can design it as one holistic system. Uh, so to date, most of our applications have been in the area of high-speed communications, although there has been interest in using this technology beyond that in sensing sensor applications, uh, particularly in bio, biochemical sensing. We started commercial deployment in 2009 uh, with optical transceiver chipsets. Uh, mostly they've been focused around InfiniBand HPC usage, although you know it's been uh, getting more deployed in you know other interconnect markets as well. Um, you know, we started at, at 40 gigs, so 4 by 10 gig, and that, that rate has gradually increased, and we're in the precipice of uh, you know, 25 gig uh, commercial deployment. Um, and these chipsets then get packaged into various form factors. It could be you know, like an MSA type solution that is like a module uh, or a cable. They could be embedded. Uh, really, at the heart of it is a piece of, of silicon IP that can go pretty much anywhere a standard silicon would be allowed to go. So this is a 100 gig chipset. It's four, a little over 100 gig actually, but it's it's four lanes at 28 gig on the transmit, and likewise it's got receive function as well. And you can see here it's just silicon. Um, you know we we have a couple of you know unique couplers and a couple of tonic elements in there, but uh, you know it just it looks like silicon. It acts like silicon. It's tested like silicon. Um, you can see a little bit of performance on the right. So how does this matter for HPC? Well, you know, when I look at HPC on slide four, I see two very aggressive trends that the industry is expected, expected to follow. You know, in the last, just look at the performance projections in terms of, uh, you know, flops. You know, we've already got like 30, 40 petaflop machines. And, you know, we're, look, we're expecting that to be over an exaflop by the end of the decade. It can be thereafter. And, you know, to make that happen, we have to, you know, reach a similar exponential growth rate in the interconnect throughput, which, you know, is, is now in the just over 100 petabit per second range, but quickly moving to exabit per second and beyond. You know, we're expected to meet, and we've seen this in the past, you know, about 10x improvement in HPC performance every three to four years. So... You know, again, that 30 petaflops today needs to be an exaflop by the end of the decade. And the interconnect needs to keep up. Uh, it needs, this is definitely the 
fastest growth rate we've seen for, you know, of all the different industries, Interconnect. Um, but, you know, 190 petabits per second today, moving over to five exabit per second by the end of the decade is, uh, is, is a pretty big ask. And all the while, we have to realize these exponential increases in performance with without commensurate increase in power and cost. I mean, systems that exist today are already approaching the practical limits of power. So the next generation systems have to get, you know, much, much more efficient in terms of uh, milliwatt per gig and dollar per gig. Why it's important to, at least in our mind, to consider subatomics when doing this is, is really the integration. You know, contemporary solutions, as can be seen on the left, you know, have typically used like kind of a faceplate pluggable interconnect, which is a convenient form factor. But to use that, you have basically two interconnects. You have the interconnect from the faceplate on, and then you have the interconnect to get to that faceplate because the silicon that is actually creating the traffic is usually located some distance away. And that brings a lot of signal integrity issues that in turn bring a lot of power and can bring a lot of cost. Uh, you know, looking at 100 gig solutions that exist today, the power uh, end to end, including the host I/O and, and the module, can be in the 15 to 20 milliwatt per gig range. Which, you know, if you're trying to do an exabit of interconnect, is just not going to work. The next sort of step that has already been taken to a certain degree and is being taken to a larger degree next is to, you know, pull that optical function into the into the box. You know, get it close to the silicon, to the source silicon as possible, to you know reduce those that second interconnect, the you know, electrical interconnect you need to save power, to save cost, to increase density, and that's been important. It's shown some pretty dramatic improvements. You know, getting power down to five to fifteen milliwatt per gig, but still would not be low enough to enable you know real exascale computing. So the, the, the final evolution is integration of the I.O. you know, into the, the source itself, which is why having it in a silicon platform is very important. And this is the type of thing that, you know, we spend a lot of time working on is, you know, having full integration of optical nodes with all the higher level host function, computing, basic switching, whatever function is required. And this, because you get rid of that second interconnect, you get rid of that electrical interconnect in its entirety, um, and you're really just talking about replacing electrical I.O. and optical I.O., you can get pretty dramatic cost savings, uh, power and cost savings. Uh, you can get power dissipation down below a milliwatt per gig if you have, you know, the right density and the right the right throughput, at which point it's, you know, arguably lower than, than a lot of copper I.O.s have been. So it can, it can enable the next generation of HPC. On slide seven, you know, these types of interconnect problems are not restricted to HPC. In fact, a lot of data centers, you know, are HPC-like today. You know, they're, they're more and more homogeneous. They're using more HPC-type uh, interconnects that are really optimized for, for power and cost because, likewise, they have the same fundamental limits, how much power they get to a building uh, and how much interconnect they need, especially for east-west traffic. With that, you know, that increased volume of deployment of these interconnects, you know, you get you get more competitive pressures. You know, it enables you to, to keep your get your power down, enables you to get your costs down. It, it's a really good thing for the HPC C community, and I expect you know over the, the coming decades that we'll get more and more similarities between the two. You know, the the opportunity for silicon photonics manifests itself in a couple of different characteristics. First is speed. What's nice about designing in a silicon technology is that the bandwidth limitations are not typically set by the optics; they're usually set by the, the photonics. You know, because you're, you're you're doing a geodiscrete modulator, you're not modulating the light source itself. Um, you have very high bandwidth on the modulation, and the detectors themselves can be made very small, so they also have very high bandwidth. Because because of that, you know, you can kind of go as fast as the industry. You can keep up with the industry. When they get faster CMOS, you can get faster faster I.O. So it allows you to keep very close cadence with compute, compute improvement. Also, as I mentioned previously, integration is 
play an increasingly important role for optics. And, and I think the, the next most important evolution is just to get to the point where you replace optical IOs with electric IOs in the native silicon. You know, you don't have it as a set of piece anymore. You don't have this two interconnected system. It's just uh, one IO for, you know, practically unlimited reach. I mean, many, many hundreds of meters. And, you know, that saves a lot of power. It saves a lot of cost because there's just much less material that goes into your system. And it allows for much higher density because actually, you know, an optical coupler can be a lot smaller than, you know, electrical IO, electrical IO coming out of a piece of silicon. So you can actually get higher density than you might really realize you can electrify. And there's an advanced function that comes along with it. You know, you can monitor many different characteristics of your link, uh, optical, electrical. Um, you can also do more advanced encoding systems to get interconnect speeds that are higher than the electronic bond rate. And slide nine is, is an example of that. You know, this is a, a case of a 100 gig optical interconnect where, you know, we have a 50 gigabaud capable electronics technology, but using a photonics transmitter, we can create a four level encoding scheme, a sample encoding scheme. So, you know, it enables us to get even higher densities because we can do this kind of unique optical architectures that may not be permissible with other discrete technologies. And, you know, finally on slide 10, I mean, I think we look around, you look at the news today, you definitely see the silicon community is growing. Um, you see a lot of other silicon providers that are looking at a commercial market. Uh, there's been a fair amount of press from Intel on uh, their open compute initiatives over the last year. Uh, IBM, you know, has a has had a strong research program for silicon tonics, and you know they they talked about their product initiatives. They haven't actually defined them yet, but uh, you know there's definitely a, a lot of ambition there. You know, Cisco with their acquisition of, of Lightwire uh, a little over a year ago, you know, is now doing 100 gig LR4 module for 10 kilometer interconnect, and they expect their use to grow into other you know, solutions as well. And Mellanox is recent acquisition of Kotura, uh, there's the expectation that you start to see, you know, them doing a homegrown standard band type interconnect using this technology. So that that's it. I, I hope um, I hope this was informative and you know I definitely see that the need for HPC interconnect in the future is very interesting market and I think that the growth is going to allow for very good things in the optical community. And you know we're definitely excited at the possibility it opens up for silicon tonic development and silicon tonic deployment. And I'm looking forward to it. Well, well thanks for that, Brian. You know, it, it occurs to me that as, as we move to exascale, right, the power is one of the big barriers, right? They, um, um, an exascale machine today would, would probably need the Hoover Dam to power it if, if we could even build the machine today. Uh, I was going to ask you about the interior of machines rather than interconnects between devices. Do you see photonics moving to that level where, you know, components within the computer itself start using photonics instead of copper? I think it moves, I mean, it moves more into the system with each generation. You know, yeah. I think the now pretty much anything within a rack is, is optical. What well, it could be that was copper and optical was restricted outside the rack. Yeah. I think next you're going to see, you know, within drawer, a lot more optical interconnects, um, you know, including things like memory, memory interconnects, moving optical. Um, you know, I think in terms of, you know, optical, local optical communications, even within a piece of silicon or with an MCM, I think that's coming. I don't think that's necessarily going to be deployed in exascale machines, yeah. but, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the next generation 10 exascale machines, you could expect something like that. Yeah, yeah. And it, as far as when, when you guys push the limits, you mentioned that when, when the CMOS gets faster, you're ready to lock in step with that. Well, what are the factors that are limiting them? Is it uh, is it their fab or, or their wafer size? Or Yeah, I, I mean, I think on the CMOS side, it's just the, um, you know, the CMOS roadmap. You know, today, you know, you have 20 nanometer, 20 nanometer shipping in high volume, and people are already looking at 14, 10 nanometer next. Yeah. Um, you know, trying to get that, that critical dimension and that performance out of them is, is, a, is a challenge for sure. Um, fortunately, it's, it's kind of 
it's someone else's problem. You know, they, they, they get this email ready and then we use it. We don't have to push that development too much. And the the photonics have enough bandwidth that I think there's many generations of uh you must nodes before you have to worry about um worry about them becoming a limiting factor. Yeah. And do you foresee a day when we're instead of electrons we have we have optical uh CPUs? I'd like to foresee a, a day when that's the case. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, but electrons are, are pretty are pretty capable, they're pretty resilient. Yeah. You know, I think our our focus I think Silicon focus uh, for the most part has been making it very cheap and easy to go between electrons and photons. Yeah. Um, so maybe next generation you'll you'll start to see you know, as the interconnect get deeper and deeper, eventually reach a point where you have you know, so much photonic interconnect that you want to do photonic processing of that information. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure I can predict when that when that <laughs> happens, however. But, yeah. I, but I, you know, I think it's reasonable to assume it will happen at some point. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess kind of a wrap-up here, uh, Brian. What are you guys going to be showcasing at SC13 in, in Denver? Well, SC13 is, is really all about, you know, sort of the next year of, uh, you know, of interconnect. And I think 2014 has been an important year uh, in the optical market. I think you're going to start to see very large volume deployments of, uh, you know, multiples of 25 gig, 100 gig, 200 gig, 400 gig. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, SC13 is really, a, you know, a good opportunity to for people to start noticing that, start discussing, I think, about what they can do with their system. Um, I suspect by SC14... You know, you'll you'll see that a lot of that the technologies that are coming out now are already in high volume in the field, and that SC14 will be talking about you know the 50 or 100 or 400 gig solution. <laughs> wow, pretty cool. Well, great, Brian. Well, thanks for coming on today. Thank you, Rich. You bet. You bet. Okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on the world of high performance computing.